Hi, I am going to teach you how to love physics. And that happens when you learn how to understand physics. Last time I gave you definitions of three vectors, position, velocity, and acceleration. Now we will look into the consequences of one simple case of acceleration, the case when acceleration is constant. This may seem restrictive, what happens if acceleration changes, but we will have to tackle that extra complication later. And since there are many systems where the acceleration doesn't change with time, this investigation will be applicable to many situations. The formal name for the physics of motion with constant acceleration is kinematics. So let's look at what happens when the acceleration is constant. Well, the instantaneous acceleration is equal to the derivative of velocity with respect to time. This is a differential equation, and we can separate the variables, so we have the integral of acceleration times dt equal to the integral of dv. On the right-hand side, since the acceleration is constant with respect to time, we can pull it out of the integral. Note that these are not indefinite integrals because we can place limits on them. We are evaluating from an initial state of an object to a final state of the object. So the right-hand integral is simply t evaluated from final time to initial time. Let's let the initial time be equal to zero and just call the final time t. So the right-hand side is simply t times the constant acceleration. For the left-hand side, we have the integral of dv, which is simply v evaluated at the limits final velocity minus initial velocity. We will call the final velocity v at time t, v of t, and the initial velocity simply v naught. We can rearrange the variables so we can write v of t equals v naught plus a t. Now we have derived an equation based on the assumption that acceleration is constant. Notice that if we don't assume the acceleration is constant, then we can't pull out the acceleration from the right-hand side integral. So this equation, v of t equals v naught plus a t, is valid if and only if the acceleration is constant. Now recall that v of t equals the derivative of position with respect to time. Well, I am going to just substitute that into the equation we just derived. And now we again have a differential equation. We can separate the variables once again and integrate as before. The result is that position of at time t equals initial position plus v naught t plus acceleration times time squared over 2. Once again, here is an equation that is derivable if and only if the acceleration of the object is constant. So now we have two equations that are applicable if and only if the acceleration is constant. After some messy algebra that I'm not going to cover, you just check it out for yourselves or look it up in a textbook, you can derive two more useful equations. So now we have four equations we can use whenever we know a particle is undergoing constant acceleration. One, velocity at time t equals initial velocity plus acceleration times time. Two, position at time t equals initial position plus initial velocity times time plus one half times acceleration times time squared. Three, velocity at time t squared equals initial velocity squared plus two times acceleration times the quantity position at times t minus initial position. And four, position at time t minus initial position equals the sum of initial velocity plus velocity at time t times time over two. Now for the hard stuff, actually applying this knowledge in a problem. A car starts from rest and moves in a straight line at constant acceleration and has a speed of 30 meters per second when it reaches the end of a 200 meter long stretch of road. Tell me what is the acceleration of the car? Well, the first thing you have to do is not panic. Remember the principle of plug and chug. All you have to do is just find an equation that is applicable to the situation given in the problem and use it. We are plainly told right off that the acceleration is constant. So we know we have four equations, the four kinematic equations, that are valid for this problem. The question asks for acceleration. So we know we want to look at either equation 1, 2, or 3, since equation 4 is the one that does not have acceleration in it. 
Now we need to learn how to actually read a physics problem. We need to translate the verbal description into actual numbers. What quantities can we deduce as given from the problem statement? Since the car moves in a straight line, only one dimension is involved in this problem. The final velocity is clearly given as 30 meters per second. The phrase starts from rest implies an initial velocity of 0 meters per second. The phrase reaches the end of a 200 meter long stretch of road implies that the final position is 200 meters away from the initial position. We can make the origin wherever we, we wish, so let's just put it at the initial position. So the initial position is 0 meters and the final position is 200 meters. We are given both final and initial position and we want velocity. The only equation that has just those quantities that includes the quantities of final and initial position and final and initial velocity and acceleration is 3. All the quantities are implied to be in the same direction, so we don't have to even discuss this sign convention. We can just let everything be positive for this problem. So now we can plug in our numbers and solve for the acceleration. And we do that, and we get an acceleration of 2.3 meters per second squared. I made the problems to be a straightforward use of the plug and chug, but I introduced the descriptive language that is found in typical physics problems. Notice all we did was substitute values into an equation that applied to the situation. As simple as it is, the problem demonstrates some of the basic keys to solving physics problems that are often overlooked. First, I had to be absolutely certain that the equations I used applied to the situation. Remember, I verified that by acknowledging that the problem statement clearly stated a constant acceleration, which is the type of situation the kinematic equations apply to. Then I had to correctly interpret the verbal description of the physical situation into numerical data corresponding to terms in the equations. Make sure you understand the reasoning we used for interpreting each of the numerical quantities. These two steps, choosing applicable equations and correctly identifying numerical data from verbal statements are very important to your future in physics. After accomplishing those two tasks, all that is left to do is just algebra. Well, if you have any questions, just leave them in the comments section.